Life of oh, what a job. <laughs> Welcome. Sorry for the delay. The software we're using decided to need an update right when we decided to turn it on and go live. And uh, took longer than I was hoping. But we're here and really live. Are you live? I'm here. <laughs> She's here. We're here. Today, Real Guitar Success Live, I'm going to start with a training on how to practice. Now, it might sound boring, but I got some new twists that might liven things up a little bit. And this is something that I found incredibly important. In fact, I think it's one of the most important skills with learning guitar is learning how to actually make use of your practice time and how to get things going um, in such a way that you, you can actually make progress and feel encouraged. And then we're going to do what we normally do, Real Guitar Live, is I'll answer questions. Uh, Ami will read the questions and help me answer them. And um, we'll give away an Amazon gift card at the end in our monthly drawing. And by the way, our drawing is for people who have completed the Real Guitar Success practice plan for the month. So let's get started. Practicing. First of all, I want to start with what I'll call preparation for practicing. And there's three parts to that. One is, I, I really believe you should set up a practice space. Um, I'm not saying you can't practice sometimes anywhere that's convenient. I enjoy practicing in the corner of an airport watching people walk around while I'm waiting for my plane. But for a good steady practice routine, it really helps to have a practice space. And I'm talking a space where you can set up all your stuff, have a desk where you can have a little notepad and write some notes about what you what you struggled with today and so you can open it up and the next day look and say, oh, I want to get back to that. You can see your progress on there. Of course, you, I think you should have a laptop there or at least some kind of computer so that you can see your lessons. Uh, have your picks, your guitar tuner, have your guitar in the stand ready to go. Um, I think it's really helpful also, which is something I didn't learn until later in life, to check with the rest of your household uh, particularly your significant other, and tell them what you're doing. Tell them this is important to me. It's something that personally I really want to improve on, and I'm going to try and make a time this time at every day or you know so many days a week. And could you support me on this? Could you help me? Don't expect everybody to just drop what they're doing and, and help you, but I found it really works much better if they know that it's important to you and what you're doing instead of Possibly, you know, you just start practicing during a time they want to watch something on TV and it conflicts and they're building up resentment and it comes out in a variety of different ways. Oh, and the second step now is to actually make a schedule. And I mean kind of like make a date with yourself. I like to have students plan out a week in advance, too far in advance and you, there's just too many things that come up that will bump you off schedule. But a week in advance, will enable you to think ahead, kind of get your mind set to, I'm going to do this, but at the same time, it's not so far that there's too many activities that can come up. I would start with 10 minutes a day. The thing is, if you schedule and you keep that 10 minute commitment, you're going to feel better about yourself, your ability to keep that commitment. And then that builds, if you want to start going to 15, 20 and so on, that builds the confidence that you can do that. Instead of starting with a time that you make sometimes and don't, you end up just reinforcing that you can't have confidence in yourself to make a commitment and keep it. Now, the other thing with 10 minutes a day is, I know if you're anything like me, once you start 10 minutes and you got a little more time and space, you'll go 15, 20, especially if you get into something. So why not go with it? But if you do your 10 minutes, you can feel good about you did the commitment that you set up. Then each week as you practice, when you get to the end of that week, go ahead and schedule the next week out and try to be realistic. In other words, I would encourage every day 10 minutes, but if you know that day you're gonna be out of town or you're doing something that's really gonna be difficult, don't schedule it in the middle of an activity where you're just setting yourself up for success, for failure, <laughs> not success. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally, I, I agree mean, the, with that. the failure part. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> now it does, though. <laughs> so you've, you've prepared a space for yourself. By the way, there's a habit that gets in, and this is something I've learned also later in life. Once you create the space and you go there, you start feeling like practicing, and it's, it's just the way people are built. They get into kind of a mental groove. So when I sit down in my practice space 
and I see my guitar and the usual stuff when I sit on the practice, my body and mind go into practice mode. So it gets much easier. I'm not always swimming upstream and I have to make myself get in the mood, so to speak. I just have to go sit down in the space. And it doesn't have to be a whole room. I mean, that's great if you can do that, have a practice room, but just a corner in the room that preferably is, you have a reasonable amount of uh, expectation to be left alone and not in the middle of traffic or the TV time for other people. So finally, the third step is to show up for your scheduled appointment. And when I say show up, I mean just all you got to do is get yourself to sit in that space. That's all I'm asking you to do. And when you get there, you're likely to be in the mood to start your practice routine. Don't lightly skip that time because again, you're, you're building a habit of keeping your commitment with yourself. And think of it like if you made a date with somebody else, you, you wouldn't just blow it off and not show up. I mean, I know I wouldn't do that. Well, certainly time for yourself, especially something that is important to you, you should treat in the same amount, with the same amount of energy, with the same amount of commitment, with the same amount of respect. Have enough respect for yourself to make time to do something for yourself and to keep the commitments that you make for yourself at least as much as you would for another person. Does that make sense? It does make sense. It sounds hard. Yeah. It sounds hard. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. And I think it's one of those things that the more you do, the easier it gets. Too. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, so now you've shown up. Now I want to talk about what you do when, you, when you're ready to practice. <laughs> I have a little kind of template that I go by. It doesn't, it's not fixed in stone, but it gives you a good place to start from. Mm -hmm. First of all, when I sit down, my idea is I want to uh, get prepared mentally. So I pull out my notes and look to see what I did yesterday and what I want to work on. Sometimes when I read, I, I don't even remember, but when I read my notes, I think, oh yeah, and I get excited to get back into that. And it's just enough to kind of get me going. Sometimes, not so much, but at least gives me a landscape of where I'm at and what I need to work on, and I can kind of project from there. So start with a, a tune-up. Make sure your guitar is in tune. I keep my tuner usually on the guitar itself. It's yours. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even have to look or fumble for it, but you know, if you got a desk tuner, it should be right there in your space. And then, mm, warm up. How's that sound so far? Is that, is that kind of like what you would have your students do? Yeah, that sounds pretty accurate. Yeah, definitely. I usually use with uh, early students a, a simple warm-up that's just, I call it speed developer. It's kind of a funny name cause, because it's really not fast. But the, um, the idea is that over time, by doing this warm-up, it actually allows you to play faster because you're paying attention to getting your fingers in the right place without too much tension. That's a little more of the exercise and so on slowly, but any warm-up exercise, preferably something that you don't have to think too hard about doing, something that is kind of routine, you can focus on just relaxing and getting your fingers in the right place, getting a good sound, no buzzing, that kind of thing. If you're practicing for 10 minutes, this is like maybe a three-minute warm-up. Start with um, the warm-up and then move into what I'll call a focus um, topic. A focus topic is something that you've chosen that you want to work on and improve on. So that's what I do when I'm looking at my notes. I'm thinking, what is my focus topic going to be? And for 10 minutes, you might only have time to make one focus topic. So a focus topic could be, a, let's say I'm working on a, a C to a F, a C to an F, <laughs> to a G, a chord progression, or a song with those three chords in it. I did that on purpose because we're going to work on the F. A focus topic is, well, gee, I, I'm, I notice I'm having a hard time getting from the chords in time, but also I'm really fumbling when I get to that F chord and it sounds horrible. So you think, focus topic. I'm going to narrow it down to something I can realistically work on and make improvement on in five, six minutes. That F chord needs some work. So that's going to be my focus topic, the F chord, and then also changing from the F chord to another chord, I'll say the C chord. So now I'll narrow that down and make an exercise that I could actually work on, the F chord. Let's break it down. I'm using a partial bar, but it, all the notes sound horrible. Let's go back to the beginning. I'm gonna start with just that first 
little partial bar which is covering two strings. So let me see, I'm gonna press down. I remember now my knuckle, first knuckle needs to go in. Yeah, try this with me. Because F chord is, is often a stumbling block for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, how do you say that? Buckle, buckle yeah. the first knuckle and then raise up the second knuckle. Now let's see how that sounds. Okay, not so good. Let's move it around a little bit. But I'm, I'm making an exercise out of just that part. Okay, check it out, let's try it again. Mm, mm. Okay, check my thumb, yeah, thumb back a little bit so I can buckle, yeah. Got a little space there, let's try it again. Getting better, okay, shake it out, let's try it again. I might do that 10 times. Like, if I just get it once, that's not enough. You gotta repeat something a few times to get, you're building a habit, you're building a mind-body connection. Neural pathways is the, the word I was taught. Okay, so let's say I did that 10 times, I made some improvement. Perfection's not an issue. Just, I'm looking for some improvement. And as much improvement as I, I can make in the amount of time I've allotted. Now I'm gonna do another exercise I've created for this focus topic. I'm gonna add the second finger. So let's bar that first two strings, first fret, the partial bar, and add the second finger on the second fret, the third string. Yeah. Wow, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> Okay, so I'd shake it out again another 10 times. Now, possibly, I might even stop there and just try going on, because I only got six minutes. I might try changing from the chord, just do that little partial thing. I know that by the time I can do this, when I add the third finger, it's really gonna be a small leap. So I might, for that focus topic, just practice going from the this little part of the F chord. It actually has a name, it's a D minor seven, but with the open D string, but it doesn't matter. For me, it's just a, a, on the way to the full F chord. So I might practice that. Uh, so that's, that's all about the time I got for my six minutes. That's my focus topic. Now, if I had a longer practice, maybe 20 minutes, I might go on to the second focus topic. And the same idea. I would find something I need to work on, kind of break it down, make an exercise or two out of it practice it for five, six minutes, if I had another 10 minutes or so, maybe longer, if it's, break it down to enough exercises that I could use up a whole 10 minutes. Then I want to integrate it back into the whole thing I was working on. And work on that for a minute or so. See how it integrates, again, doesn't have to be perfect. Now I'm gonna close up, let's say that's the end of my 10 minute practice session, I'm gonna close up and play something that's Easy or fun or both? I'd like to end on a positive note. Yeah, definitely. So how does that sound with what you would have your students do? Yeah, I think that sounds pretty close, pretty close to what I um, to what my students would do. I definitely have them start with a warm up. We use a different exercise called Caterpillar most of the time, which is similar, similar. to like stuff that you've done before, just kind of a finger exercise. Um, and then I'll typically actually have them go from there into something that they already know just to kind of like start the session with some confidence like okay i've heard you, that before yeah, yeah just i've heard other teachers play. doing that it depends on how much time you have to so mm -hmm. if you have 10 minutes i probably wouldn't add in a song that you're really yeah, that's a good point with. um but you know if you're able to put in a little more time even if it's just a couple chords jamming out to a couple things that you know you can do confidently um and then one thing that like if, if my students have a longer amount of time one thing that i have them do especially if we're playing a whole piece is i have them struggle through the whole thing one time Okay. Um, you just play it one time so that way you're giving yourself an opportunity to kind of like figure out what are the sections that really need the work. Well, that's a good point. How do you, yeah, I, I think I skipped over that because you really need to try it, especially on your own, huh? Yeah, definitely. And see what you need to work on. Yeah, and then, like I said, it does depend on how much time you have. And good maybe point. even for a guitar player, you'd just be doing like a small chord progression, you know, maybe four or five chords long. You kind of go through it and you're like, ah, transitioning from F into C is really not the best for me. So you can just make a little mental note um, and then I have them play it again and then they stop where they messed up. And then um, one thing that I really, really work with my students on and it works well if you're reading music, like sheet music, but works well for chords too, is they have to learn how to put it in context. Um, so let's say there's a particular measure or just like a little piece of a song that you're learning that you really don't get. You'll stop, do a couple exercises like you were describing, kind of get in there, take it really slowly so you can get it down. And then you're gonna play the measure or the chord before it, and then the hard one, right? Mm. And you do that a couple of times. And then you play the hard one and the measure that comes after it, or the chord mm, that comes that's after That's a good it. point. Then you do all three. 
So kind of ease way, into playing the whole thing. Exactly, because I, I found just in my personal practice experience for any instrument that I play, if I just isolate that one measure and do it, do it, do it, do it, get it down, then I start at the beginning and try all the way again, I'm, and once I hit that measure, I'm like, pause, my brain yeah. freezes because I have to get back into the exercise mode. So it sounds like one way to say that is you're kind of working on the transitions. Yes. From the thing that you worked on to transitioning on both sides. Exactly. I know that I saw a lot of students when they're like playing a piece that repeats. Mm -hmm. They really have a hard time when they get to the end getting back to the beginning. Yeah. That would be a good transition to work on. Yeah, that's a good transition. So anything that requires you to transition, either whether you're playing a melody, like it's a, you know, it's a different melodic figure, or mm -hmm. if you're playing a chord progression. Starting with something that you know, getting into the hard part, then getting out of it is just as important as knowing how to do the hard part. Because um, then otherwise you can just do the hard part by itself, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, I can't play not, a progression. Not going to be much fun if you're going right. to play one little phrase out of a song. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then again, uh, just like you said, I, end, I like to encourage my students to end the practice with something fun. Um, and I also, one thing that I actually learned from you that I really like is setting up that weekly schedule and having different things you're working on throughout the week, mm -hmm. which is one reason like I love like RDS, you know, the whole guitar online system has that kind of set up for you. So when you are practicing, you have specific things for each day that you're going to work on. Mm -hmm. um, Cause it's, it can be really easy if you're getting your daily practice to not remember what you need to work on that day. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, you're just going to pick it up and play something cause your teacher said you got to play something. And it's hard to get started if yeah. you're not sure that you're supposed to work on. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Hard to want to sit down and think, oh, I don't know what to play today or practice. I, I get a question asked a lot. I wonder if you get this. Mm -hmm. um, when do I know to move on? Of course, probably more uh, with somebody online because you don't have the teacher going, oh, you've done that enough. Come on, let's do this next exercise. Mm -hmm. I, I get that a lot with people online. I've come up with a system. Of course, there's no absolute formula that works exactly every time for everybody. But I've come up with a system that helps me when I'm working on my own and has helped a lot of students. I call it the 80% rule. The idea is that you work on something until you feel like it's about 80%. You're making a judgment based on how it sounds to you as well as, you know, compared to what you've heard on the lesson online, the, either the play along or the actual lesson. So when you get to about 80%, it's time to force yourself to move on to the next thing. If you move on too fast before that, you're going to get to a place where the material gets more complicated and you just can't keep up. Or more importantly, you feel like you can't keep up. You feel incompetent and it gets very overwhelming sometimes and frustrating. The other part of that is though, and I've seen this just as much, is people try to get something uh, because they feel that it's not quite perfect and they just get stuck and don't move on and feel like they're not making progress. That can be very just as frustrating, I think, and I've seen it just as often. So the 80% gives you kind of a mental idea so that you can rely on that to just move on and not feel guilty about it, not wait until you think you can do it every time perfectly. The other thing is that 20%, you'll get that just by moving on, playing more complicated stuff, occasionally review, I've had more than one student go back maybe a week or two to stuff that was hard when they first played it and they got to what they call about 80% mm -hmm. and they're amazed at how much better they can play it than the first time they learned it. They're amazed at how good it sounds. Now when I say 80% too, it's not an exact number and you're the judge of that. You decide that it's 80%. There's not some board of guitar players that's going to say, no, that's not 80%. And you'll find out over time as you do that you'll get better at making a judgment that works for you, that allows you to move on and still kind of get that other 20% and feel good about your progress. Yeah. I think something to consider as well, um, just as a beginner or even, even intermediate or advanced, you want to make sure that you're playing things that are at your level. Hmm. So if you're a total beginner and uh, let's say you've only been playing guitar for a month and a half and you want to learn the intro to Stairway to Heaven, well... That's a that's a that's funny. big thing that you want to learn. That's you're, great. You're a lot younger than me, but when I was your age, that's what people were asking for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a popular one because it's still really pretty and yeah. it's finger picky, you know. And I made the mistake more than mm -hmm. once of just trying to please the student and getting into it, and it's not that simple. I yeah. mean, it, what they do is fumble and struggle with it, kind of play it, and what would happen is they um, 
kind of do things, tense up their hand and make strange contortions to try and make it work. Yeah. And now we're getting habits that I have to break or help them break over time. Yeah. You're there, they just get frustrated and quit so they can't do it. Yeah. The way I always tell my students, especially kids, because they can be really impatient and want to get it done now. Although grown-ups are probably a little bit more impatient, I have to admit. Uh, but one thing I tell them is like, you couldn't just put a three-month-old baby on its feet and tell it to run. Hmm. Right? I mean, it's going to fall over. Uh, and so it's it's similar like that, you know. Now you can kind of like pat them on the butt and get them to scoot and move, which is great. So do that to yourself. Get things that are challenging, but you don't want to take something that's like way out of your league. It's just going to break your confidence. You can create bad habits. And in the long run, you're not really doing yourself that much of a favor if you're challenging yourself to the point where you just plain don't get it. Um, so are you saying uh, guitar students are kind of like three-year-old babies? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, and you might think this is playing devil advocate, but it's not exactly. Mm -hmm. It's not an either or. There's another side to that. If you always stay within your comfort level, yep. progress is, can be very slow. And exactly. I will test to it from personal experience as much as seeing my students. So what I mean by that is it's really helpful to have sequential material that you build up to about 80% and then move on to the next thing that's just a small step above that and then the next thing above that. Yep. It really works well for specific techniques for uh, especially like theory and stuff where you have to understand one concept to understand another. But there is equally a place for putting yourself out there trying something that's either too difficult or just out of order and fumbling and feeling uncomfortable about it and, and just getting used to that feeling of mm -hmm. incompetence. I really, the first time I really got this is when I was young, much younger, yeah, there's a few years between now and my young self, <laughs> um, I was learning Spanish and I took several years of Spanish lessons. At college level, I got good grades. I'm a good student. I knew how to work the test, the writing, but I still, after two years, couldn't converse even simple have simple conversations with people in Spanish. Then I took a class that, and I did this out of, I, I needed to push myself a bit. I took a class that part of the class was in Spain and I had to live with a family mm -hmm. that was instructed not to speak a word of English. Ooh. It was, it was hard, not a little, even, a, <laughs> it was uncomfortable at times, sometimes even downright painful. And now I actually look at it as one of the uh, better experiences in my life. I got over in two weeks of being able to speak. I could converse with people. I got hungry. <laughs> I needed to know where the bathroom was. I just went for it. Yeah. And as time went on, I took that and brought it home and was able to make friends who spoke Spanish. Mm -hmm. I ended up being able to travel all over the world and, and converse with people in Spanish. And I'm still learning, so it's, it's even more fun learning every time I talk to somebody in Spanish. Yeah. And I wish, looking back, that I had done that much earlier in my development. Because both the sequential lessons and that pushing myself into situations where I just had to try and fumble and kind of get a gauge of where I'm at and uh, things I need to work on, would have, I would have progressed much faster, all in all. I have the same feeling about my music. If I had gotten out of my room and went out there and jammed with other people or just tried things beyond my level sooner yeah. and felt uncomfortable, just got used to that feeling, I would have progressed much faster, I'm sure of it. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that's actually really helpful, just in general, I mean, this is like a general learning and music thing, is having some guidance. Having some, like, clear-cut guidance. I mean, all of you are doing well because you're here right now. So clearly, the people watching this are looking for guidance and help. So that's a really great first step. But using all your resources, um, just because, like, you know, if you try to teach yourself a new skill that you know nothing about without any kind of resources, I mean, you're just playing a guessing game. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel. This stuff has been created and laid out uh, for you all. So, you know, use things that are at your resources and take your time and definitely challenge yourself and enjoy the challenge. So those of you who are uh, on part of my premium membership program, The Real Guitar Success, there's lots of program modules that are sequential and step-by-step. Step. If they're not, I actually tell you in the introduction, this is not a sequential program. Mm -hmm. But there's also something called The Beginner's Journey, which is uh, for students starting out just very step-by-step. Step. Mm -hmm. Give them all the different things together in a sequential manner. Yeah. But at the same time, I include things like the Guitar Gymnasium, where there's a practice plan every month with unrelated things to accomplish. And that gives you a chance to kind of stretch out and you can save the ones that you think you want to work on more and just move on with the ones that 
that you've had enough on after the first try. Yeah. So that provides some of that experience of kind of just stretching and fumbling a little bit. I mostly want students to be able to get the experience of feeling uncomfortable out of their league, but in some kind of controlled manner, not constantly being bombarded by new and uh, things that are beyond their capabilities. Yeah. I would encourage, though, at least try jamming with other people, practicing uh, different lessons that might be a little beyond, with no expectation of, of getting it perfect. That's the idea. And just finding opportunities to get used to feeling kind of out of your league. It gets to be not comfortable, but it gets easier and easier. Absolutely. Mm, what do you think, guys? Are we ready for some questions? I think so. I have a couple for you. Let's do it. All right. So we have uh, Bernard who submitted beforehand. Um, and he said, is there a technique for changing a chord with ease from one octave to another? Okay. So I'm not honestly sure exactly what that means, Bernard. And, and feel free to, if you're live here, to, to write in and explain a little bit more. I'd, I'd love to hear it. Generally speaking, an octave means moving everything up eight notes. And I, I can't see why I would want to move a chord up eight notes. I might want to raise it up higher on the neck, meaning form the notes in a different order. Maybe I'm playing some chords down here and then there's a chord way up here and I'll want to change all the other chords to match it up here, maybe for sound or maybe just for convenience. Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't call that moving it up an octave. I would just say, you know, I know a number of different places to play a C. And there might be a, oh, <laughs> there's another one. The other, there might be a reason I'd, I'd want to move some chords up closer to each other or something. I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. There's no, um, there's no easy way, by the way, either that I can think of. Probably be, there's no easy way to just think of moving this chord up eight notes, everything up eight notes. Chords are made of individual notes, so to actually move every single note up eight notes wouldn't necessarily either be easy or make for a good sounding chord. Uh, I hope that gives you some ideas. I, I think you might be trying to express something, I'm just not sure. Yeah, I think that's a pretty clear answer. Okay, to you, you don't have any other ideas on that? No, no, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, you can kind of reconfigure the chord for convenience or for sound if you want a higher um, sound. It's a really common thing on the ukulele just because we don't have much range on the uke, right? I mean, you can only really do two octaves at best. Um, so it's a little bit different. I mean, there's just kind of no need really on the uke. So for guitar, I'm assuming, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing. Well, else it's just for the sound and convenience, like you said. What, one way I thought of I could do that, if I played an E here, I could play an E way up here on the bar. That's it. Of one, that's E one octave higher. Right. Uh, but you could see as soon as I got to an F, that gets harder and harder because you can only go so far up. And, right. And I, I can't think of a good reason I'd want to do that either. Right. Yeah. Uh, we did have another question come up um, from David, who's visiting us online. Uh, David says, hey David. Um, looking for hints to memorize songs beyond repetition and endless reps. Oh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing I found, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this, mm -hmm. is learning common chord patterns. And some people call them common chord progressions. Mm -hmm. And there are one such one, just to give you an example, would be what we call a one, six, four, five. I hope I didn't totally throw you <laughs> off there. Okay, so that's four chords. Here's an example of that. And if you recognize it, different way it could be any one of dozens of songs when the windows can understand me when everything I do is wrong that's Elvis or my strength. <laughs> oh dozens of songs I, I, I don't want to take up your time but the thing is it's a common chord pattern mm -hmm. one six four five I'll explain that in a minute and by knowing that pattern and the 
hopefully another handful of patterns like that. You can look at songs, recognize the patterns. In some cases, it's the whole song. Yep. Well, you're, you go to town because you've practiced those patterns and you, they just fall right into place. Or, which happens more often, mm -hmm. you look at the song and say, this much of the song is a common pattern, this is not. I know the pattern, that's not a problem. Let's work on this little part that's not a pattern, then integrate the whole thing together and away we go. Much easier than starting from the beginning and without recognizing there's a pattern there. Yeah. Now, 1645, I'm referring to a terminology we often use in music. Uh, we're talking about the chords in relationship to a scale. So a scale has uh, seven notes, starting with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. And we build a chord on each of those notes. Then we can call them depending on the number that that chord is built on. So mm -hmm. a, let's say a C scale. The C note would be number one. When we make a chord out of that, that would be the one chord in relation to the C scale. Yep. Count up C, D, E, F, that's four. C, D, E, F. Mm -hmm. Now the F is the four chord, and five chord would be C, D, E, F, G. C, D, E, F, G, yeah, I did that right. Yep. So that would be a one, four, five progression. One chord, C chord, four chord, F, and G. Often, when you um, construct chords based on one scale, uh, it's going to make a chord pattern that's something that you recognize. One, four, five is a very common pattern. Mm -hmm. One, six, four, five. So I just count up to six. C, D, E, F, G, A. And it happens to be A minor. Right. And it, with it, the, always the sixth chord is a minor if you're working with a major scale. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more on that. And I encourage you to find the, um, the post I have on uh, the Roman numeral system. I have one on uh, YouTube that can explain more about that. What, what do you think about that? Do you use those terminologies, one, six, four, five, one, four, five? I do a little bit um, with my students in general, just because it's kind of basic music theory knowledge, especially if you're playing any chordal instrument, right? Now, if you're playing like a flute or sax, That's true, huh? if they're helpful, like it's good to know. I can say from, from like a woodwind player's perspective, especially if you're gonna play jazz, you, you have to kind of know that stuff. Um, but like if you're playing classical trumpet, there's, I mean, you're gonna know about it, but there's really no reason. For chordal instruments, though, it's really important. My biggest, biggest tip, and one of the actually awesome things about learning how to play pop music, is that pop music in general has is created with simple forms. So if you can take the verse, and let's say it uses just a basic, you know, one, four, five chord progression, right? You take that verse and you just work on it a couple of times and memorize those chords and the order of those chords. And then you take the chorus and you memorize the, the order of those chords as well. So it can feel like less of a feat um, because you don't you don't feel like you have to memorize a whole song. Instead, you're just memorizing two little things, right? A little progression and a little progression. You just smack them together. Now you've got verse and chorus and you can just kind of like repeat that throughout the song. And then sometimes what's called the bridge or a different section of the song will have a different chord progression. But like you said, you can just kind of take that section and play around with mm. it as well. Sounds like what you're saying is to actually look at the song and look for the patterns, whether or not they're common chord progressions, the yeah. patterns in the song itself, Absolutely. where the parts repeat. Absolutely. And one thing that's really helpful is to just, and I can't stress this enough, got to get to know your fretboard. Mm. I mean, like, and I use that with my students a lot. Like, you don't, it's a common question. People are like, do I have to memorize every chord? Well, not really, but there are some common ones that you definitely want to know. Like mm. the, the one, four, five, six you were just talking about in the key of C is like, 40 songs. I think there's something like 40 songs that you can find with just those chords that are popular that people know. Hmm. Um, that's kind of my two cents on it. I just say, you know, break it down and think of, think of music as like a roadmap. You know, if you look up the chords to a song online, use it as a roadmap so you can kind of guide where you want to go. And mm -hmm. then, of course, add flavor throughout it and do what you do with it. Yeah. There was a time, I, I tell a quick story, there was a time where I was uh, gigging all the time and I would get hired as a hired gun. That means um, a band would say, hey, we need, we need somebody for Saturday night, our, our regular guys out of town. So can you fill in? Sure. I would show up, no rehearsal. They would tell me, the leader of the band would tell me, usually whisper in my ear or pull me aside, this is a one, four, five progression, but watch out for the bridge. There's this change, a, a, a flat two. And, uh, then we'd smile and go to town, and uh, sure as heck, I would get people to come up and say, God, you guys sound great. How long have you been together? 
<laughs> it's just because I knew the common chord progressions and the leader knew, he knew what to tell me in terms of like what was different about it so that I would be, have my ears out and be ready to go. And then once you got the groove going, of course, even little mistakes, I would keep smiling and <laughs> just act like nothing happened. It's the best way to do it. <laughs> what else do we got? Mm, I don't see any other questions for now. So while we put out the last call for the questions, maybe this is a good time for the raffle. Okay, we'll do the raffle. If you got any other questions, now's your last chance for this time. Of course, we'll do it again in the next first Thursday of next month as well. Let's see. All so, right. Phil. <laughs> Phil. Phil Benoit. Did I see it right? Yeah, looks like Phil. Benoit. So um, she's acting like she's fumbling around, but just to be clear, Phil is. This is the only one that completed <laughs> for this month. I just want you guys to know who are part of the membership, really, you have a good chance of winning if you complete the 20 uh, lessons for the month. Yeah. Congratulations, Phil. Good job. And I'm happy to send you the Amazon gift card. So it'll be in the mail today, probably, for the end of the day. Cool. Any, anybody show up with a question? No. We'll Nothing you. about 1645? I thought somebody was going to ask about that. Let's see. I remember when I first heard this in school, I didn't know what the heck they were talking about. I have a question that came up while what? you were talking about, um, when you were talking about scheduling time to practice um, and, you know, kind of checking in with people in your household and stuff. But do you have any other tips on maybe a time of day or like knowing when is the best time to practice or how to fit that into your busy schedule? Well, I have experimented with that and I'm, I, I'm actually, from talking to other people, I can see that there's only one way to do this. People have different kind of uh, rhythms in their life and of course different households, different setups. Mm -hmm. I encourage students, especially young students, to get it over with early because as the day gets going, they tend to get busy and forget about it or just feel tired. Yeah. So I'd encourage if, if you can, start your day with that or start early enough. I, I think you probably should brush your teeth first. Probably something like that. Something, take a shower, I don't know. The, for a lot of people um, who are working stiffs, uh, like most of us, <laughs> um, after work works to, as a kind of a calm down. I think it sometimes can be a little hard to focus, but um, I don't know. It's, it seems to be a, a nice time for some people to have like their own personal space before they reintegrate into the next phase of their life. Mm -hmm. You know, I have some people that really like to do it before they go to bed. I don't, I don't know if that's the best time for me, but it works for, I talk to a lot of people that seems to work. Yeah. One thing I actually encourage my students to, take this with a grain of salt though. <laughs> this is, um, for I, you know, I may have uh, students who are working parents or single parents and just like crazy busy all the time. Um, and one thing I recommend is like, this doesn't, your practice time doesn't have to exclusively be this big grandiose part of your life. Like you can find times to integrate practice into your day to day. For myself personally, and I, of course I've been playing music for years, when I watch TV, I have my ook and I just do exercises and that counts as a warm up. And then, you know, I'll pause my show or whatever and do five, 10 minutes of this song, five, 10 minutes of that song kind of throughout my evening um, and just kind of integrating it into my evening as opposed to making it this large event that I feel like I need to put my whole life on hold to do this event. Um, so that's just one tip that I have. I used to be really against uh, practicing guitar and watching TV because I, I think that dividing your attention that way hmm. um, lessens both. I, you know, you can, it depends True. on the program. Some programs don't take a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. But I will have to admit that over the years I have taken on that practice as yeah. well. <laughs> the thing is, if I really want to work on something new or to improve on something, I need to put my full attention. Absolutely. But I can practice easily. I can warm up easily, and I do practice for a longer periods of time, mm -hmm. for a half an hour or even an hour show, doing things that I already know how to do and get my fingers warmed up. And I don't really have to pay that much attention to the shows. They're not that complicated. Yeah. It's just sort of like give fill in some background while I'm doing some kind of monotonous stuff. When I find something I need to work on, I'll make a space to actually just focus on that. And that's the other reason I do encourage just start with 10 minutes a day because yeah. people are busy and if you start with some great idea that you're going to practice a half an hour, 45 minutes a day, for a lot of people that's just enough to throw them off because they know they don't have the full half an hour so they do nothing. Yeah. 
Yeah. What we do in my household is my practice time is my fiance's video game time. Cool. So he gets to play the Xbox. That's, I that's get a great idea. Yeah. You don't feel guilty about like taking time away from doing something yeah, together? Yeah, because you're both doing your own things. And we sit next to each other on the couch and he plays his game and I play my music and it works really well. Oh, I like it. I'm yeah. going to try that, actually. Yeah, there you go. Not video games. Something else. Sure, <laughs> My yeah. wife likes uh, something else that she enjoys doing for that time. Yeah, it's cool stuff. Well, I don't see any other questions for now. We did, uh, Andy says... Hi, Thomas. Thanks for the 1645. I'm going to incorporate this into my daily practice. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome, Andy. <laughs> Thanks for the comment. Cool. I love to hear. I love to hear anything, actually. Just know you guys are out there listening and, and at least interested in what I'm saying. Yeah. All right. We'll close it for today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again for taking the time out of your day. And for those of you who watch